Hello everyone, welcome to the Imaging Study YouTube channel. After a long break due to COVID-19 pandemic, we are back with another lecture. We are going to start our basic obstetric ultrasound series. We will include several video lectures in the series. As the first lecture, we will talk about the basic first trimester ultrasound scan today. This will be a long session. If you feel tired, just stop the video and watch again later. No need to finish on one setting. I have made it long so that you can get all contents in a single video. This video is for educational purpose only. It's made for medical professionals. I highly recommend you to watch this for study purpose or for experience. Today we are going to talk about ultrasound safety, indications and timing of the ultrasound scans, patient preparation and brief scanning techniques, then we'll go with the normal findings and first trimester biometry. Lastly, we'll end with some common first trimester abnormalities. Before starting, I would highly recommend you to consider subscribing our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to get notified about our future uploads. We have planned to include lots of radiology and study related contents here. You can also follow us on other social platforms. All the links are given on the description box below. Before starting the obstetric scan, you will face a common question by your colleagues or patients. Is ultrasound safe in pregnancy? Well, there are lots of controversies. It's not easy to finish on a single ward. Long history of ultrasound shows no definite documented adverse effect on human body. But there are some hypotheses which may take our concern. We transmit sound waves through the patient's body. When this sound wave comes in touch of the body tissue, some events happen. Some waves pass through the tissue, some get refracted, that means change the direction, some get reflected, we call them echoes, and convert them into an image. Now another event happens. Some sound waves get absorbed by the body tissue. This is what we are worried about. You know, energy can change its state. So when the sound waves get absorbed, they are converted into heat. Now this heat can cause some genetic or chemical effects inside the body. Again, we are transmitting sound waves into patient's body. This wave creates a very tiny pressure over the body tissue. This pressure can also cause some genetic or chemical effects inside the body. Unfortunately, this hypothesis are proved on experimental animals and trees. On experimental animals, ultrasound has been proven to cause different types of congenital anomalies, even postpartum death. That means adverse effects of ultrasound could not be proven on human bodies but on others. So, now we have ended with a summary that we will believe ultrasound as a safe procedure for human, but we should do it only when clinically indicated. We want our pregnant patients to visit our ultrasound department at least three times during pregnancy. Our first scan should be within 6 to 12 weeks. We want to confirm the pregnancy. We want to exclude early pregnancy-related abnormalities like abortion, ectopic pregnancy, molar pregnancy, and blighted ovum. Sometimes we see patients not willing to come at this age. They think that there is nothing to see at this age as the embryo is very tiny. But you need to know whether there is an intrauterine or extrauterine gestation. Even we commonly see them to have their first visit after 12 weeks with a molar pregnancy or a blighted ovum. Doctor patients commonly do this unfortunately. So we need to be a little more careful about ourselves. During pregnancy, there are lots of parameters to detect the gestational age. Among them, only the cram rum length or CRL, which we use to measure between 7th and 12th weeks commonly, gives the most accurate gestational age. So, to measure the accurate gestational age by crown rum length, especially in case of a patient with uncertain last menstrual period, we want to scan her at this age. 
We can exclude Down syndrome and encephaly or few other congenital anomalies at this age. Especially a routine nuchal translucency scan or NT scan is done in different countries at 11 to 14 weeks to exclude Down syndrome or other chromosomal abnormalities by measuring the anechoic gap between the neck skin and spine called nuchal translucency. At 18 to 22 weeks, we want to do our second scan. You know that organogenesis gets completed by the 18th week. So to detect organ-related abnormalities, that is congenital anomalies, we do a scan at this period. Nowadays, clinicians routinely send patients for anomaly scan within this period. At 32nd to 36th weeks, we want to go for the third scan. At this time, we want to make a plan for delivery. So we note the number of fetus, presentation, lie, biometry, placental position, and grading, amniotic fluid amount, any gross abnormality. Overall, we try to make a report on fetal well-being, which will help our clinicians make a better plan about delivery. So these are the three common ultrasound scanning periods. Don't hesitate to do ultrasound other than these periods if there is any clinical indication. There are several documents like continuous 40 hours scan caused no harm to the patient. Even I did more than 28 times ultrasound scans during my wife's pregnancy and no abnormality occurred. Actually, we use a very small energy. The highest energy used by us during ultrasound is for Doppler and 4D ultrasound. To create those effects, you need to use 4 or 5 times more energy. That's why it actually can't cause harm. So be confident about what you are dealing with. You won't do more scans than me during your pregnancy. In case of first trimester transabdominal ultrasound scan, patient should come with a full bladder. If you do TVS, then the bladder needs to be empty. As my lecture is the basic one, so I want to focus mainly on transabdominal scan. So why we need a full bladder for that? Uterus is a deeper organ. Sound waves can't reach that deeper well. Reflected sounds from the uterus can't also reach to the transducer. So we can't see the uterus well. We need a window now through which we can see the uterus. That acoustic window is the fluid-filled urinary bladder. When you fill the urinary bladder with urine, it will appear as a fluid-filled structure. You know the physics. Any fluid fill structure will show a bright echogenic area posture to it. We call it posture acoustic enhancement. It's quite like that you fill the bladder and it enlightens the posture area like a light bulb. We use this light to see the prostate on male and uterus ovary on female patients. As on the first trimester, uterus doesn't get bulky enough, we need a filled urinary bladder to see its inner contents accurately. Now how to fill the bladder? Tell the patient to take 4-6 to six glass of water and to walk if possible. Your patient is on NPO state, cannot take anything by mouth. No problem, hospitalize the patient, start an infusion. Tell her to come when the bladder gets filled. Patient came to you as an emergency. In case of upper abdominal scan, we do ultrasound without any preparation on emergency basis. But for lower abdomen, you can't see anything on empty bladder. So for those cases, we enter a catheter per urethra and fill the bladder with sterile normosaline. But this should be avoided if possible as there is a chance of infection. In your practice, commonly you won't need to do catheterization. Because when you tell your patient about catheter, she will rather choose to drink water. Sometimes patient will come to you with catheter. For that situation, clump the catheter and tell your patient to drink water. Otherwise, the patient will continuously empty catheter back and it may create some unwanted situations. Anyway, now apply ultrasound gel over the lower abdominal skin. For transducer, we'll go for the low frequency curvilinear probe. We use 2 to 5 MHz frequencies, but I don't want you to memorize that. You should change the frequency and choose a suitable one which will make the organs well visualized. We usually increase the frequency for thin patients and decrease for the obese ones. If you want to do a transvaginal scan, then use high frequency TVS probe. TVS is the best tool for early pregnancy evaluation. 
It is helpful in early detection of normal and abnormal pregnancy. We'll talk about the regular transabdominal ultrasound findings. If you do TVS, then you will be able to see those features at least one week prior to the transabdominal scan. We don't want to do TVS on second or third trimesters as there is a chance of injury or infection, especially in placenta previa and premature membrane rupture. But TVS is indicated on second and third trimesters for detection of cervical incompetence and confirmation of placenta previa. Otherwise, it's better to avoid. Here on the left, you can see a normal cervix on TVS. Cervical canal looks good. But on the right, you can see a narrow canal with V-shaped or Y-shaped indentation of the sac into the canal. It suggests cervical incompetence. Anyway, we will talk more about cervical incompetence on a separate video. Again, back to transabdominal scan. Patient is examined on supine position. You can also rotate the patient if needed for any better visualization. Fast trimester scanning is same as you just ovary scans. Put the probe over the lower abdomen below umbilicus up to pubic bone both longitudinally and transversely. Start at midline, then gradually try to go laterally. Rotate and tilt the transducer during scanning. Never press over the lower abdomen, just touch with adequate ultrasound gel. You have told her to feel the bladder. If you press, then sometimes it will be difficult for her to hold. I hope you don't want to see your hand and bed getting wet. Okay, now let's talk about the ultrasound features. At fifth week of gestational age, you will see a tiny anechoic structure at the center of the uterine body called gestational sac. At sixth week, you will see another anechoic structure within the gestational sac called yolk sac. At seventh week, you may or may not find the yolk sac transabdominally, but you will see a small embryo looks like a solid structure. At eight week of gestation, you will see moving structure within the embryo that's cardiac pulsation. So gestational sac at fifth week, yolk sac at sixth, embryo at seventh, and cardiac activity at eight week. If you have a good machine or doing TVS, then you will see these features earlier. But if you have got a poor quality machine, then you have to wait more. Most of the cases will follow these timings on transabdominal scan. Now let's talk about these features separately. Firstly, the gestational sac. At this fifth week sized gravity uterus, you can see a tiny anechoic cystic structure at the center of the uterine body. This tiny round anechoic structure is the gestational sac. Check the gestational sac on another image if you have found that image hazy. If you do TVS, the sac appears more clearly even at fourth or early fifth week. Another tiny sac within the uterus. Now a practical problem. You have seen this sac. You know that the patient is pregnant. You are now telling the patient like, congratulations, you are pregnant. Patient is telling you, I am unmarried. My husband is working abroad. There is no way that I can be pregnant. Now what will you do? At South Asian countries, if you try to argue with your patient at this situation, patient party will attack on you for blaming their patient. So that's an embracing situation. Now what will you do? You can advise urine for pregnancy test or beta HCG. In my country, patients come after taking a both efficient drug and they try to hide history. And they won't do these investigations. Ultimately, the situation is not comfortable for you. So you need to know the differential diagnosis of gestational sac and sonological confirmatory features. Actually, there is no exact differential diagnosis of gestational sac. Sometimes endometrial collection may look like a sac, but actually nobody gets confused about that. So let's talk about the conformative features of gestational sac. Gestational sac is an anechoic cystic area. Always you will see endometrium making special appearance around the sac. You will find a complete hyperechogenic ring surrounding the gestational sac. You will get another hyperechogenic ring surrounding the sac incompletely outer to the first complete ring. 
This complete and incomplete rings form a combination called double decidual sign, double ring sign, or double decidual reaction. If you see this decidual reaction, then it's definitely a gestational sac, no matter what your patient says. Here you can see a gestational sac on a magnified view. You can see a hyperechogenic ring surrounding the sac completely. You can see another incomplete hyperechogenic ring at some parts. So this complete and incomplete rings form double decidual sign. Another picture of a poor quality machine, but you still can identify the double decidual sign. This is the first hyperechogenic complete ring, and here you can see the incomplete echogenic ring. Let's look at some other cases. Here embryo is seen. If embryo is seen, then nobody actually search for those rings. Anyway, this is the complete echogenic ring and this is the incomplete ring. So double decidual sign is present, patient is pregnant. Another image and you can see complete and incomplete rings. This is another poor quality machine image, but still you can identify those complete and incomplete echogenic rings surrounding this tiny gestational sac. Okay, now come to the yolk sac. At sixth week of gestation, you can see a tiny anechoic cystic structure within the gestational sac. This structure is called the yolk sac. In early ages, embryo gets its nutrition from the yolk sac. After the development of placenta, yolk sac will get atrophied and you won't find that. The wall of the yolk sac will be hyperechogenic and the lumen will be anechoic. With poor quality machine, it's very difficult to see yolk sac clearly. Even sometimes, good machines may not be enough to evaluate the yolk sac comfortably. If you do TVS, then yolk sac and its abnormalities can be identified easily. You can even see a vitellian duct connecting the yolk sac to the embryo to provide nutrition. Just remember that yolk sac is an anechoic structure. We'll talk about its abnormalities later. At the seventh week, you can see the embryo. At this age, we can't actually see the embryo spots well. The thicker part is called the cranial region, and the thinner part is the caudal, that means the thoracoabdominal region. One to two weeks later, you can easily differentiate between head and body. Here on real time, you can see a beautiful yolk sac. At the eighth week, fetal cardiac motion is well seen. At around ninth and tenth week, fetal tone and movement centers develop respectively. Tiny embryo starts to jump, creating a smiley face of mother watching that. You can see the heartbeat here. Cardiac activity can be better visualized using color Doppler at this age. Due to those hypotheses I have mentioned earlier, some doctors don't want to use color Doppler to detect heartbeat at this age. They want to wait a little. This is the four-dimensional view of the embryo you have just watched. And here is the cardiac pulsation. Limbots are seen as small projections from the body at around eight weeks. Limbots elongate and gradually take the shape of limbs at 8 to 9 weeks of gestation. At around 10th week, you can differentiate the parts of the limbs. You can also see the embryo's movement clearly at this age. You then can see fingers of the hand on this embryo. So embryo is getting developed and enter into the second trimester.
Now come to the hard bit again. Right one shows York sack and Embra on the left. We will see this Embra on real time. You can see the fetal hard bit here well. Another one, you can see the yolk sac and embryo. Embryo has a good cardiac movement. But due to poor machine resolution, it is getting difficult for you to understand. If you walk at rural centers, you will commonly get this type of machine. So if you can't see heartbeat on early age, don't be hurried to say Mr. Boshan. Try to give a follow-up after one week. Your machine will try to make you fool. If you want to know about early pregnancy missed abortion diagnosis techniques, then don't forget to make a comment on this video. If you have got color Doppler facilities, then you will rarely face this type of confusion. Color Doppler can show fetal cardiac activities since when you have seen the embryo. Let's see this embryo on real time. Here you can see the embryo and yolk sac. You can see cardiac as well as fetal movements. Yolk sac is seen near to the lower end of the embryo. If you magnify the image with your zoom option, then cardiac activity can be better visualized. Another 8-week sized embryo and call Doppler shows cardiac pulsation. Now how to measure this heart rate? There are two different ways to get that. First one is using the M-mode or motion mode ultrasound. On M-mode, we convert the real-time B-mode image on a graph. Where there is no movement, you will get a straight line. If there is any motion, then you will get a wavy line. So we put this line over the fetal heart pressing the M-mode button. We can see the graph. At the level of heart, you can see a nice wavy line. Now your machine can calculate the number of waves per minute. That's how you can get the heartbeats per minute. Remember that this measurement technique differs from machine to machine. You have to click on the heart rate measuring option, then have to put the cursor over the same points of two consecutive waves. Some machines need measurement from the same point of two alternative waves to get the result. So you need to know your machine's technique before you start measuring. Otherwise, you will get every case as bradycardia or tachycardia. A mode in early pregnancy may not be easy always. Here you can see two pictures taken on a low-quality machine. I have measured from the same points of two alternative waves here. But the waves are not too good to measure accurately. From my practical experience, if you magnify the image before going to M mode, the webs will look much better. The second technique is the pulse wave Doppler, which some doctors won't love due to fear of those mentioned hypotheses. Here the webs can be well visualized. Measurement technique is quite same as M mode. You have to measure from the same points of two consecutive or alternative webs depending on machine. I have measured from the same points of two consecutive webs here. Pressing the PW or Pulse Wave Doppler button, the webs will come like this. After measurement, we can see that the heart rate is 174 beats per minute. Usually we say that the normal heartbeat in first trimester is 140 to 180 beats per minute. If you see less than 140 beats, don't be so hurried to report it as bradycardia. Just recheck after 10 to 20 minutes. Sudden decrease in heart rate in early pregnancy is not uncommon and most of the times physiological. Here I have measured from the same points of two alternative webs. Heart rate is 181 bits per minute. Just recheck after 10 to 20 minutes and you will see the heart rate will be within normal limit. Here you can see the gestational sac and embryo.
hotter it is visualized and more better on a magnified image. There is an adnexal cyst which we will discuss later. Lastly, here we can see the yolk sac. I want to make a request now. Please do not think yolk sac as fetal head. Yolk sac is a cystic structure, not our head. When you are getting yolk sac, you won't be able to differentiate fetal head well from the body. And when you can easily identify fetal head, then you won't be able to see the yolk sac well. Now I have to put the color Doppler and you can see the red and blue colored cardiac pulsations. Past rib Doppler shows beautiful wave for measuring heart rate. Okay, we have seen all the contents of early gestation. Now we want to know the gestational age. Think about the new structures you have seen. You have seen the gestational sac, yolk sac, and embryo. You can measure gestational age from all of these. There are lots of different parameters for measurement, but the main problem is that those of you working at rural centers won't get all the measurement parameters available on your machine. So, as a basic lecture, I will talk about three common measurement parameters today. Gestational sac diameter or GSD, mean sac diameter or MSD, CRL or crown lamb length. Among these, gestational sac diameter and mean sac diameter give good results before 8 weeks. Crown round length or serial gives excellent result between 7th and 12th week. And this serial gives the most accurate result among all the parameters of gestational period. Now let's talk about each of them separately. Firstly, the gestational sac diameter. At 5th or 6th week, you can easily get the gestational sac as a round cystic structure on longitudinal or transverse view. You have to click on the gestational sac diameter or GSD or GS button of your keyboard or screen and measure a diameter of the sac from inner border to inner border. This is the gestational sac diameter. Very simple walk. Remember that we used to measure lumens inner to inner and solid structures outer to outer. Here I have got a small round gestational sac and I have measured inner to inner by pressing the GS button of the machine. Sometimes you ask me a question. Should we measure it transversely or vertically? Well, it's a round circle, so the measurement will be same no matter how you measure. To prove that, I have also taken measurement by different style. All of them shows the sac size is of 9mm that corresponds to a 4 weeks and 5 days of gestation. Now come to another sac. At around 7th or 8th week or even earlier than that, you may get an oval gestational sac. If I measure vertically, the measurement will be smaller. If I measure transversely, the measurement will be larger. Then what will we do now? We will take a mean result. That means we will take one measurement vertically, one transversely and one obliquely. We will now make a mean of these values like we did in our school maths summation of all values and dividing them by 3. This is called the mean sac diameter or MSD. If you get MSD option in your machine, then click on that, take 3 values, machine will do the rest. Here on the right picture, you can see an oval sac. My machine had MSD option. I clicked on that and took 3 diameters. My machine showed an average value of 1.5 cm, which corresponds to 6 weeks and 5 days of gestation. We usually don't laugh the EDT showed from gestational sac diameter or mean sac diameter due to high error rate. Another one, an oval sac and we took the mean sac diameter. Now some machine may not show the mean sac diameter option. On that situation, we just take 3 diameters first, then we make an average value manually. Then pressing the GS button, we take that mean value again so that our machine can show the rest. Sometimes your machine installers don't activate MSD option on your machine. So you need to use your own inventor technique. Some machines may show you the average result of any of your measurements. For those, you need to take three separate gestational sac diameter measurements from the GS option like I mentioned earlier. And machine will show the average result on worksheet or result option. So you must check your machine before dealing with a patient. 
If you measure the MSD, then your machine will calculate the gestational age from this chart. You don't need to memorize it unless you are suffering from severe depression. It is pre-installed in your ultrasound machine. After 7 or 8 weeks, gestational sac doesn't remain round or oval. Here you can see a heart-shaped beautiful sac. This is how an ultrasound expert should propose him or her. Anyway, here you see the sac is not suitable for gestational sac diameter or mean sac diameter measurement. Fortunately, we have got the umbrella by this age, so we don't need to worry about those sac measurements now. We want to go for measuring the embryo with crown rim length, which is the most accurate parameter throughout the gestation. So let's start talking about that. Crown rim length. Crown means vertex of the head, rump means buttock. So for crown rim length, you need to choose the CRL option, measure a distance from the embryo's upper limit of the cranium to the buttock or end of the abdominal part. Quite simple. Here we can see an embryo. This is the cranial part and this is the caudal part. You can also see a limb part. We are measuring from the vertex up to the bottom. Machine will show you the gestational age and EDT. Here we can see another tiny one. Be careful about yolk sac. Do not include that mistakenly. Here I am showing you a sagittal section of the embryo. Be careful about the yolk sac you are seeing here beside the buttock. Zooming the image will give you a better view for measurement. Now you should have some questions on your mind. Let's solve them. Why are we calling it crown arm length? It's very difficult for me to pronounce it. Why don't we call it height or length of the baby? Well, you can understand it at around 10th week onwards. Think about this embryo. You can see the limbs. You don't want to look for the buttock. You are taking the length from the vertex of the head up to the lower limb. Now your patient is asking about her gestational age. You have told her that it's 12 week of gestation. Now the baby suddenly moved its limbs away. So now you are again measuring like this and telling your patient that you have made a joke of her. It's just 10th week. Patient will beat you for that. So as head and body don't show much bending at this age, we want them just to be included within the measurement excluding those moving limbs. Another complaint. At early ages, you see the embryo like a solid structure. So you face problem about measuring. You can't understand where the buttock is. Now what to do? Well, you don't need to worry about its buttock. Just measure outer to outer, end to end. Make sure the embryo is on longitudinal cut. Well, what is a longitudinal cut? It means coronal or sagittal cut. Simply think that, how can I get this round section if I cut you? Definitely, if I cut you axially or transversely. How can I get this long section? If I cut you sagittally or coronally. That means, if I get an embryo this round shape, then I can't measure serial from that. I only can measure if I can get it like this straight shaped. Now you can ask me that you have got this round cut. How can you get a long cut then? Just rotate the transducer 90 degree and you will get that longitudinal cut. Forget about the indicator during pregnancy scan if you are doctor. Just rotate and you will get the desired view. So get the embryo on long section and measure crown to rum excluding yolk sac and limbs and that will be the CRL. We are talking much here because CRL will give you the best and most accurate data. It's very important to measure it carefully. When you measure the CRL, your machine will show the gestational age from this chart. As usual, you don't need to memorize it. Let's finish this with some images. I took twice to avoid error and both says 9 plus week size gestation. 
Here I have measured MSD and CRL and both suggest 7 weeks and 4 days of gestation. As my both results are same, so I am very much confident about my result. So try to use more than one parameters if possible. If the result was not similar, then what to do? I'll describe it on my late pregnancy lecture. So don't forget to subscribe this channel to get that. For early pregnancy, CRL is the most reliable one. So we want to go with that. Another serial measurement and you can see the cardiac flow on power doppler. Again serial measurement and cardiac flow on color doppler. Here with the serial I have included a pulsive doppler heart rate measurement. You can check all your results from the worksheet or result option on your machine. Now before I end, I want to give you some idea about early second trimester. At early second trimester, we can see the fetal spine causes the fetus to become slightly flexed. At first trimester, the embryo was straight, so we took a straight diameter from crown to arm. But if you look here, the fetus is quite flexed now. So if you measure CRL now, the measurement will be smaller. That's why we want to go for BPD or FL, which I will mainly discuss on my next lecture. But the main problem is that the BPD doesn't fit with its criteria at this age. If you have a good machine, then you may not have to face this problem. But those of you who will work in rural centers have to struggle a lot. You even won't find femur on those machines. Here I have got a good machine and I was able to take good quality by parietal diameter and femoral length. But what will you do if you have to live with a poor machine? If you can take any of the measurements accurately, then what to do? Well, you have to know that we have a black period of 12 to 15 weeks at which we may not be able to detect gestational age accurately. So don't send the patient at this period only expecting to have a good gestational age measurement. If you get a patient of this age, then what will you do? Will you tell the patient, I can't detect gestational age at this period, so please come later? That patient will never come to you. So what to do? Fortunately, the fetus moves a lot at this age. We need to take a plan utilizing that. The baby was straight at all the age, now it's flexed. So the diameter we take becomes smaller. We need to wait for a while. As the baby moves a lot, suddenly you will see the fetus to extend its spine and get straight. Freeze the image quickly, measure the serial as the fetus is straight and you will get the desired result. Here I have taken a BPD from a poor quality machine. I don't know WTQ, that means what the quality was that. So I have waited for a while. The fetal spine got extended and I have freezed the image. I took the serial and that will be the most accurate one for that machine. You may not believe this opinion and argue with me but remember that it will help you overcome errors. I have seen some arguing with this concept on my previous old channel's first trimester ultrasound video. I miss my old channel. Now when will the fetus extend? Usually you will see that within a minute, but if the baby is sleepy, then you may need to wait for 20 to 25 minutes. So ask the patient to wait, have some meal and recheck later. So extend your number of parameters, try to correlate with last menstrual period and take a decision. Same here, I took three measurements. Don't allow your poor quality machine to make you suffer.
As I mentioned earlier, you need to evaluate pelvic organs along with a regular pregnancy scan. Check the measurement of uterus and cervix. Cervical measurements are important more in mid-trimester to exclude cervical incompetence. When the perimetrium gets curved or the uterus becomes narrower, then the cervix starts. We take the cervical canal length and cervical anteroposterior diameter commonly. In short, the canal length should be more than 2.5 cm normally. If it becomes shorter, then there is a high risk of premature labor. We will talk about that on a separate video. We also check the number of gestation. In early pregnancy, you may see two gestational sacs or two embryos. But never tell the patient about twin pregnancy. Just report it for your clinician who are waiting to know the cause of hyperemesis graviterum. We usually tell the patient about twins after 14 weeks. You can't memorize that. So remember that we inform the patient after we see the fetal spine. Why are we hiding this? Well, sometimes we tell the patient about twin at early age. But when the patient comes at late weeks, we get a single one and the situation starts. Patient gets too much exhausted knowing the death of her one baby. You had heard about twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Due to discrimination of nutrition, one fetus may die or even gets absorbed that we call the vanishing twin. In our rural areas, patient comes for the delivery of twin. We deliver a single baby and patient claim for stealing other one. All of these happen if you tell the patient in early trimester. You may ask me, my patient asked me the number of gestation, what will I say to her? You will say the baby is okay. To know whether there is 1 or 10 babies, please check after 2 months. Patient will think that you are making joke of her. But after 2 months, she will understand that you were right. Here you can see a 9th week sized live embryo. I have shown you this case. However, there is a round anechoic structure at the left adnexa, that is a corpus luteal cyst seen in early pregnancy. Corpus luteal cyst may confuse you with an extra uterine gestation. How to solve it? We'll talk about that on our ectopic pregnancy lecture. Comment below if you want to get that. Just a small message. If you do a follow-up scan, corpus luteal cyst will decrease in size, but the ectopic will increase. That doesn't mean we'll give a follow-up. If you give a follow-up, the patient may die. We also check the nuchal translucency, the anechoic gap between the neck skin and the spine. Between 11 and 14 weeks, this gap should measure less than 3.5 mm. However, there is something more to know which I will also cover on a separate video. We exclude chromosomal abnormalities, especially Down syndrome, with that. 3D ultrasound may sometimes give you some excellent views. Here is the tiny embryo and yolk sac on the right. On the left, you can see the complete and incomplete rings of decidual reaction. Another two cases and you can see tiny embryos inside. Real-time 3D or 4D gives a better view after 20 weeks, but still you can get some now. If you want a lecture on 3D or 4D ultrasound or picture processing techniques, then I have already uploaded a few of them. You can check those also. I'll put a link for that playlist on the description. Okay, now let's have a quick look at some early trimester abnormalities. You can see an embryo here. You are trying to look for the cardiac pulsation, but there are two findings out there. This is mild collection at the posterior cul-de-sac. Here, enter to the sac, you can see some perisac or subcurrent collection that you should not miss. Another one, and now you can see the separation quite well. This subcurrent collection may or may not cause abortion. 
Usually clinicians prescribe medications along with complete bed rest and commonly we see a good outcome on follow-up scans. Here we can see a tiny embryo. CRL shows 8 weeks and 4 days of gestation. On Doppler, we can't see any cardiac flow inside. Here is that on real time and you can't see any cardiac activity even on Doppler. You should definitely see the cardiac movements at the 8 week or when the serial is 9 mm or more. So this is a case of missed abortion. Another case of missed abortion. Serial is 18 mm and corresponds to a 8 weeks and 2 days of gestation and no flow on Doppler. Another embryo without cardiac activity. Sometimes you may get confused if you are walking with a poo machine. Don't be too much hurry to diagnose missed abortion in early pregnancy. Just do a follow up scan for confirmation.
sarcoma is a common case. Pregnancy test is positive here due to presence of trophoblast layer. Sometimes you will see this type of tubular sac. Longitudinal and transverse section won't show a round or oval sac for a proper measurement. Check the history of your patient. Patient will complain about vaginal bleeding. So this is a case of incomplete abortion. You can see the irregular gestational sac at the lower uterine cavity without any embryo inside. There is a corpus luteal cyst at adnexa. That's all for today. I know you are tired like this baby now. Don't forget to repeat any part when you feel confused. Comment below about what you want next on this channel. Feel free to subscribe this channel. It will help build a community and reach more people. Share this video with others. We will see you on the next video. Till then, have a nice and safe learning.